Please introduce yourself, state your name, and DOC number for the record. Rick Aaron, 224-264. All right, Tori, my name is Brendan Kelsey, along with me is Mr. Freeman. Mr. Roche will be your panel. We'll have a parole interview, ask you some questions. You can respond at the end. You can make a statement. We'll take a vote. You understand the process? You understand the process? Yes, sir. Okay. We have uh, Mr. Randy Meyer who will speak at the appropriate time. We have Carrie Myers, Doriel Dorsett, Sherry Jackson, Quincy Bates, Tori Mol Molson, and Deborah Henry. And we have a couple that will speak. <clears throat> Tori, care, DOC number 224264, second class offender, pro eligibility date 2, 24, 2024, good time 3, 2, 2037, full term 2, 5, 2044. You are a second class offender, uh, manslaughter, 40 years. Does that sound correct? Yes, sir. And let's see. Yeah, that's it. All right. Would you answer, Mr. Uh, Freeman? Yes. Okay, Mr. Kerr. Uh, how long have you served on this charge? 19 years, six months. Okay. And uh, what's your educational level? I achieved my high school diploma here. Okay. Tell me a little bit about what happened. What what, what got you uh, in the position you in? Well, um, I was sitting on a staircase of my home. You know, I heard a voice call my wife's name. So I proceeded to the window. And when I looked out the window, I saw a guy and my neighbor was standing up looking at my window. I didn't really... Didn't understand what was going on at the time. I didn't know what it was about. So as I proceed down my staircase to get to the door, as I opened my door, the guy jumped in his truck and left in the, in the neighborhood. She went in her house. So I didn't think nothing of it. So I just went back and sat on my step and just contemplated on what was going on. You know, I just sat there all night till the next morning. And I was eager on to find out what happened that night. So I asked my wife as she brought up, you know, I said, oh, we, we, we need to talk. So she asked me what it was about. And I asked her, and I told her that they had a guy at our window calling your name. She said, well, um, I didn't hear nobody calling my name. You just, you know, you making it up. I said, well, the neighbor was with her. We could go down there and ask the neighbor what's going on. Maybe she could um, tell us better what was going on. So, so we did. So as we got outside, I asked the neighbor, I asked, why was the guy calling my wife's name? And she said, she didn't know. So, you know, that indicates to my wife that I just wasn't making it up. And she just was like, well, she and I too. So I said, well, we really need to talk because things are not, you know, it's not working right. So as we go back inside, we talk, we go in and we on. Um, I ask, I ask my kids, I say, well, we all need to own talk. So as we went in the room, I was asking her what was going on. And she was like, that I was tripping, that I didn't know what I was talking about, that I was just making that up. And I'm saying, how could I make something up like that when the, when the neighbor was saying that, you know, she didn't even know why he did it himself. And I did the worst decision a man could ever do to was his wife. You know, um, I grabbed a knife, you know, I made a bad decision. I was wrong, you know, and I take full accountability of that. So I, if that my wife not trying to body home, I was just trying to scare just to get information who the guy was where he was staying because I had my three kids in the house and I felt though it was very disrespectful, it was very dangerous for him to come to my home, you know, and anything could have happened. My kids, one of my kids could have got hurt in the process of me coming home and he was there. So as I if towards her with the knife, I looked in her eyes and I saw she was scared and she was supposed to be. I would have been too. And she threw her hands up and the knife hit her hand. So I told my, I told my kids to get out of the room. So my daughter Taurus, she stayed in the room 
And I can remember the night falling and picking it up. We struggling for the night. And my daughter told her, she, you know, she was saying, stop it. She tried to um, come break us up. And I pushed Tori out the way because I didn't want Tori to get hurt. I told Tori to get out the room. So as we struggling for the knife, the knife, you know, is I, I can see the blood from her, the knife hitting him. And I got so weak to where the knife wound up hitting my wife in the neck. And she fell on the floor. I pulled the knife out of the neck. And I told her that, you know, she's going to be all right because I hear sirens coming. And I left out the room. I left out the house. I made the, the, the worst mistake I could have ever made. I, I, I left my wife in that by herself. And, and I, I regret that to this day. You know, just not one day go by that I don't ask God to forgive me for that. And I knew I heard it. That whole family and those people was good to me. They accepted me. And they did for me, and I and I let them down. I betrayed them, and not just them. I betrayed my other kids, and I betrayed my family. And then I was apprehended later on, and I didn't know she passed. I thought everything would be, you know, would just be all right. So the detective told me that my wife had been passed, and, 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 and that would happen that night. Uh. Is Tori your biological daughter? Yes, yes, sir. Okay. And she got stabbed in the hand too, right? Yes, sir. Trying, trying to break y'all up. Yes, now, sir. The knife just cut her throat, but she was also stabbed seven times, so it wasn't more than... Yeah, it was a, it was a struggle. I, the knife was here. That's why I mentioned that I was seeing blood all over. I also had... the um, lacerations in my hands uh, trying to, you know, to, to, to seize the knife. Okay. Uh, were you on drugs when this happened? Yes, sir. I was I was, I was. was on drugs. I was drinking. Yes, sir, I was. What, what kind of drug were you taking? I was smoking marijuana with crack cocaine laced in it. How old were you started when you were using drugs? Started using drugs at the age of 19, 20 years old. Okay. You ever got any kind of treatment for your drug uh, problem? No, sir, I haven't. Uh, you have law enforcement opposition. Um, you have one period of supervision. It was closed satisfactorily. You've also had an arrest uh, where they, they say you had a firearm. Did you have a firearm? Well, I never had a firearm. I had a, I had a previous uh, arrest, I want to say in 90, 90, 92, 93, of a firearm. Okay. Uh, you know, looking at the victim statements, you know, they, they say they don't have to remain confidential. So I, I'm going to read what your daughter said. Uh, she said, uh, when you asked if she participated in counseling, she said, most definitely. I spoke to a counselor at school, but I was too ashamed and didn't know how to accept help. I have trust issues to this day. I am guarded, and it affects my family and partner relationships. I reached out to him in the past, and it didn't go well. He didn't take any accountability. He acted like he was the victim. I don't want a relationship with him. I hope he gets help for uh, the help that he needs. And she said her worst fear is that this could happen to someone else. Uh, also, the victim's brother also wrote a statement, and he strongly opposed uh, for basically the same reason. You hadn't taken many classes. Why is that? 
first went to Angola, they didn't have thinking of the change then, living in balance. They say I had too much um too much. Uh -huh. Well, when I went to Angola, they allowed me to go to school and take anger management. So I've been in Angola two years. And when I went to Rayburn Correctional Center, they didn't allow us to take too many, too, too many classes. The only thing we was allowed to do was go to school go to school because they said I had too much time to be putting on the list. It was only taking guys that were five years and under. But I have achieved something of abuse, anger management, pre-release, self-esteem, um, and um, and life skills. I have taken them. I have a forklift operator training course. Mm -hmm. I have a gardening training course. Victim awareness. Yes, sir. For at least 100 hours, I have took victim awareness as well. What did you learn in victim awareness? I've learned that my wife, my wife's family, my family, the people in the community, they all became victims for what I have done. I've learned that they had faces, names, and hearts. I've learned that I caused them anger, hurt, pain, and them being unsafe. I proceed to take the classes, to be a productive citizen, and have self-control once again. Okay. Uh, why did you refuse to take the 12-step program? Because of the drugs I've used and I needed help. Okay, but that would, well, why would you refuse it if you needed the help? I never refused 12-step. I have the, um, the certificate. I took that class. Okay, good. Uh, what is going to be your resident and employment plan? Well, I have all my, my, my employment plan. My uncle have a job waiting on me. And I also have a, another job lined up with JJ's Auto Mechanic. My resident plan is to go to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Okay. And uh, what is your sobriety plan? My sobriety is to, to, stick, to, to be around positive people. When I get weak, to get, ask for help, to stay positive, to keep working, to stay strong, and be responsible, to take accountability of my actions of what I have done. Uh, you have tons of support letters. What is your job at the barracks? My job is MBO. I've been working on janitorial maintenance since 2009 up until then. So you've been at the barracks uh, 14 years? No, sir. I've been at the barracks a year and a half. That's just the same job title I have. Maintenance in janitorial. I've been doing that since I've been in coastal Okay. Warden, what do you have to say about uh, Mr. K? Um, when, when I met Corey, uh, I was one of the people who interviewed him to come here. Um, and it was hard for me to listen to him talk, honestly. Um, being married to my wife for 31 years, I couldn't really understand what was happening at the time. And then we talked. And I, hmm, I saw his grief. I saw his hurt. And I saw his heart. I know this is a difficult decision for y'all, for everybody involved. But I believe in him. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Corey, I'm ask you something about your disciplinary record. What is a 30F? That's when you're under investigation, like when you run in the store, things so, like that. What, what did you get written up for a 30 F for? I saw you lost some good time because of it. Um, that's, that's what it was on um, for me operating a canteen out of my locker box. Okay. All right. Uh, and then your last write-up was in uh, 2017. Yes, sir. And it was for aggravated disobedience and a theft. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I have no further questions. All right, Mr. Uh, Mr. Roche. Corey. Yes, sir. Alvin, Alvin Roche. I, 
I just looked over your rap sheet and there's so many violent offenses. Where did this all this violence come from? Uh, your first arrest was in 1987, possession with the intent to distribute marijuana. That's the battery, uh, assault, uh, battery again, simple robbery, aggravated assault. Where did all the violence come from? It come from me making all the bad decisions in my life, drugging, drinking, running the streets, not being up to what I'm supposed to do as a man. I've been in a home with my mom and my dad, and you know, I'm not going to say it was everyday peaches and dandy, and I just try to do the best that I can to try to make it up on my own in the streets, and the streets led to a lot of those incidents, sir. How long had you been married when you killed your wife? We've been married for, I want to say, three years, two years and a half, something like that. But we, we have been together for 15 years. So any time during the time you were together, were you incarcerated? No, no, sir. I never have been incarcerated. This is my first incarceration. So basically... All your convictions before this, you were put on probation. Well, sir, I've never been convicted for one time, and that was for marijuana, and that was in 1988. That was my only conviction up, up until now. So all these other arrests were di dismissed? Yes, sir. Thank you, man, uh, Mr. Chairman. All right, we'll hear from Carrie Myers. Uh, good morning, Carrie Myers with Louisiana Parole Project. We're here. Uh, for Mr. Care. Uh, after 19 years of, of incarceration, we understand uh, that he's going to need transition. Uh, Parole Project is prepared to help him with that. One of the things that we will do is provide him with a both a substance abuse and mental health assessment um, and, um, and follow any recommendations from that assessment uh, to get Mr. Care into any type of, of uh, programming that might uh, that might follow from that assessment. Um, he has taken victim awareness and anger management and substance abuse during his incarceration. He has earned a forklift certification. Uh, he has an employment plan. He has a long-term residence plan. Uh, parole project will provide him with case management uh, with a coach uh, essentially to to help him through this transition. Um, he will have a coach. Uh, not only uh, in the practical things, uh, but he'll have a coach. It, it's some someone who's been already through what he will be going through in the, in his transition, and I think that that peer mentorship is one of the most important things that we could provide. Uh, someone who has that experience, who understands uh, the things that he will be facing, uh, someone who successfully navigated that. Uh, so we would just ask this board today to consider uh, granting Mr. Care to parole project and then to his long term residential plan. All right, thank you. We're here for Ms. Doriel Dorset. Good morning. Um, Hi. I'm Doriel, I'm Tori's oldest daughter. Um, I'm first, I want to say, um, I'm proud. Um, I forgive and I'm proud of my dad. Um, reason why I'm proud is because he, I feel like he used the tools that was given to him while he was incarcerated and he did something with it. Um, he's grown a lot. Um, I'm just proud of him. I, I challenge him, you know, with his thinking. Um, some things he'll come let me know by him being a mentor. Um, he'll come let me know some of the things that's going on that, like, you know, that he sometimes he'll get frustrated with things and I and I, you know, I'll just tell him, you know, use the tools that was given to you when when certain things come about. Um, I told my dad, like, I support him. I support what he's um, what he's trying to do, um, the good, you know, how his growth. I'm 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 just here to support him, you know, with whatever that's going to help him grow as a man. 
All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Now we're here for Mr. Quincy Bates. I can't hear you on me. Okay, my name is Cleansey Roy Bates. I'm the father of Tory Cal Bates. He's my fifth child. He was a good man. He never gave me any. All right. Sounds like you're cutting out on us, though. Sounds like you're supportive of him. Uh, looks like your, your phone connection's cut, up, cut out. All right. We'll hear from now. We'll hear from Mr. Randy Meyer. Good morning, Randy Meyer, Assistant DA Johnson. We're opposed to Sorry, Randy, just a second. Y'all got to shut off. All right, Mr. Randy, go ahead. You're on mute. Okay. And All right. Randy Myers, this is D.A. Jefferson Parish, and we're opposed to Mr. Kerr's request. Um, and that comes about after listening to, to his statements. Uh, uh, as Mr. Freeman pointed out, his daughter um, stated that when she had met with him long ago, he didn't take any accountability. And that's what I heard in his statement that he gave to the board. Um, he's describing the crime and, and I, I didn't quite understand it all, but basically he said he kind of missed, he kind of slipped and the knife cut his neck, cut her neck. Well, uh, she actually had the laceration to her neck, a stab wound under her left arm and on her back and her right shoulder. Um, and she was stabbed seven times. He's not being truthful as to how the offense occurred. He's trying to play down what happened. He also said that, uh, you know, he was concerned when he, when he saw some guy allegedly going, going, I guess, calling his wife's name, that something might happen to his daughter. Well, his daughter uh, got between her mother and her father to stop the beating that he was giving to his, to his wife. And his daughter got stabbed got cut on her wrist and, and, and got cut. Um, that doesn't, to me, that doesn't say that he's got a lot of concern for his daughter. Um, he was there to, to beat up his wife and stabbed her seven times. Uh, his criminal history has a, a number of violent offenses, as Mr. Roche pointed out, battery, assault, weapons. Um, the, the record does not suggest that he's taken a, a lot of substance abuse, and I think he said no, he hadn't taken substance abuse, um, although he did take this 12 steps, which I also saw in the record that he had refused it. Maybe he had refused it at some point in time and then later took it. Um, but another thing his victim says is he definitely needs some substance abuse treatment. Uh, he needs drug rehab and counseling. And I think that is, is very apparent that he does need that. Um, and, and there is victim opposition from uh, his son as well. So for those reasons, we're opposed to his request. All right. All right, Troy, would you like to make a statement on your behalf? Mm -hmm. I can't hear you. Y'all must be on mute. First and foremost, I would like to thank the board for giving me this opportunity. I would like to say that I'm sorry to my daughter, Tori, Dejanero, Jean-Quel, and Jean-Jacques Mortensen. I would like to say that I'm sorry for causing such pain. I take full accountability of that. I regret it deeply. I am so sorry that every, each and every day that your life is not be the same that you have to carry that on. I, I'm sincerely remorseful from y'all not having our moms with you at this time, missing all the events that y'all have. I regret everything that I have done to hurt that family, to hurt my family as well. I take full accountability of that. 
I have taken the classes to help myself to be strong and have strength. I just want to apologize to the family from taking their mom life from them and from them have to live with that each and every day. Now, one day go by, I don't ask God to forgive me for that. If I could turn back the hands of times, I would. And I am deeply sorry, and I apologize once again, and I regret it deeply. Thank you. All right, thank you. Now, prepare to vote. Yes, Mr. Freeman. Okay, Mr. Chair, um, you have done a ton of things. Excuse me. I think that's his daughter who wanted to. What, the daughter wants to speak. I didn't see it here. Who, who is that? I'm sorry. Would you like to speak? I can't. Okay, I can't hear you. You're his daughter? Yes. Okay. Yes, you were, I'm his daughter. What's your name? My name is Daisy Mollison. I'm Tori Mollison. She's currently in class right now. She's in nursing school. And she would like for me to speak, you know, and say something. And what's your dad. name? You're speaking in your Tori? I'm Dejanera Mollison. I'm his younger girl. Okay, okay. Dejanera, all right. Go ahead. So I'm here on my dad's behalf to say, you know, I'm very proud of the man he became in jail. You know, I talked to him multiple times since he's been locked up, and he has improved it, though. Like, we talked about the things that happened, and, you know, he explained to me, and I talk to the Heavenly Father every day. I have to forgive my dad for me and him to move forward. And I would like for, to see him come home to be able to see his grandchildren for him, you know, and as well as Tori. Tori, you know, she has been the one who got cut in the incident. She has gone through so much things, but she explained to me she would like to see her father come home. You know, everybody goes through things. And, you know, we're not the judge to say who should be locked up. You know, the judge is the man above. So on her behalf and on my behalf, we would like for our father, you know, to come home and live a second chance. Because if my mom was here today, she would say the same. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Okay, now, panel, prepare to vote. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for that comment. As I was saying, Ms. Carey, you, you've done a ton in prison. I also want to thank everybody that showed up today, especially your daughters. Um, but I, too, uh, I mean, when I read the, the investigation, I, I see no responsibility taken by you. I was trying to scare her. Yet you cut her throat and stabbed her three times. I mean, I, that's that's not trying to scare anymore. That's trying to kill. So my vote, and I think you need drug treatment. And I will recommend that we try to get him to Steve Hall if possible. And then you can reapply to my vote today is to deny. Mr. Roche. Mr. Kerr, based upon express opposition from the victim's family, Law enforcement opposition, opposition from the DA in Jefferson Parish, history of violence, and I think you need more time at the state police barracks in light of responsibility for your actions. My vote is to deny your request. All right, you have two votes to deny. I'm also going to vote to deny for the same reasons as stated. Uh, keep working hard. You're right there close. Try to, you know, take a little more accountability. Be a little more honest when you give your uh, statement. But my votes to deny. Three votes to deny. Today your parole's been denied. Good luck to you. We'll adjourn at 10-11. State Police Barracks. Thank you. Thank you sir.